As the world's second largest economy, China has long held the mantle of manufacturing supremacy. However, the once seemingly invincible facade is showing signs of vulnerability. Across city landscapes, numerous unoccupied and unfinished apartments hint at economic challenges. Rising unemployment and muted discontent among the Chinese public raise questions about the state of the country's economy. What lies behind these developments, and could this be a turning point for China? Let's find out. The government just ceased reporting data, but the percentage of 16 to 24 year olds who can't find work more than quadrupled in a matter of years, from 10% in 2019 to over 20% this summer. If you believe that the past few years have been difficult for the NASDAQ, simply look at the Chinese stock market, which has seen a 40% decline in value since 2021. Or real estate for that matter? Chinese land sales fell to their lowest point in a century last year. A particular desperate developer is luring prospective purchases with properties valued at just $70,000. That's because there is less consumption. There is now deflation. Plus, we are witnessing the decline of the Chinese population for the first time. What has led to this sharp decline that contrasts with the rapid growth of the Chinese economy a few decades ago? Most people have agreed throughout the past 20 years that the East is rising and the West is fading. However, there's a growing sense that the East has grown. Is peak China already behind us? During the 2008 global financial crisis, this ought to have been catastrophic for China, but its biggest trading partner is the United States of America. Millions of workers and thousands of Chinese companies depend on the American consumers who are unexpectedly unemployed and forced to pay for mortgages they couldn't afford. However, China got back on track by 2009. In actuality, it was the first significant economy to rebound. China's economy expanded, and by almost double digits no less, while the economies of the United States, Japan, Germany, and the rest of the globe shrank. Ten years later, the COVID-19 pandemic originated in China. This upset the balance of supply and demand, and there was no way for factory and service workers to work from home. However, Beijing surprised everyone all the more. It not only survived the catastrophe, but it did so as the first nation to fully recover. Its exports quickly reached previously unheard of heights. Briefly, nobody has ever profited by betting against the Chinese economy. Thus, what is China's method? It's straightforward. It builds when in doubt. Bridges and roads, tall buildings, stadiums, airports, whatever this may be. It operates along these lines. First, borrowing money is ridiculously simple in Beijing. It cuts interest rates and suffocates state-owned businesses with copious subsidies. It would take a foolish person to refuse to build roads, bridges and tunnels when capital is freely available and the socialization of failure is widespread. A large portion of this investment is ineffective. However, it increases the GDP of the nation and generates jobs. Now this chaotic architecture made sense for a while. China was impoverished, underdeveloped and in dire need of even the most basic infrastructure when Deng Xiaoping came to power in the 1970s. Even a bare two-lane road or a one-story school represented a significant improvement over nothing. China had to build first and think later to catch up with the developed world. Check out Ordos, China's spooky ghost city. Today, Ordos is home to almost 2 million people. It's peaceful, but far from deserted. In 2017, CNN featured this picture and the headline, Metro Station Amid Nowhere, China. Around the world, readers found this humorous white elephant to be funny. Then two years later, the station looked like this, and amazement replaced laughing. Most of the time, those who criticized were in error, and when millions moved into cities, supply eventually kept up with demand. But this cannot continue indefinitely. China must, by definition, continue to increase its investments to sustain economic growth. In the meantime, the construction's returns are becoming worse and worse. China already has wealthy infrastructure and a middle-class economy. There are just too many things to build, with 3 million miles of roads and 25,000 kilometers of high-speed rail. After exhausting almost all apparent avenues, China is turning to increasingly dubious enterprises. For instance, this is the world's tallest bridge, measuring at 2.3 thousand feet in length and 1.8 thousand feet above the ground. It's a marvel of engineering and architecture. Outstanding? Of course. Sound from an economic standpoint? Uncertain. It's not in Shanghai, Chongqing or Hangzhou. 
but rather in what is essentially rural Mississippi in China. Out of all the 31 provinces and provincial level cities in the nation, Guizhou is the fourth poorest. Despite having a per capita GDP of $7.7,000, it has constructed over 500 new bridges in just two years, several of which are among the tallest in the world. Maybe this $150 million mountain bridge will become the next autos or metro station, quite literally, in the middle of nowhere. It could come alive and change the local economy. It would be stupid to gamble against any one project, considering China's history. However, it would also be naive to believe that this could continue forever. Consider this, having debt is an entirely natural occurrence. It is also acceptable for that debt to take years to start paying off. However, we know there's a big issue where debt increases faster than GDP. This is the predicament that China is currently facing. But there are now just four methods to raise GDP. Investment isn't a practical alternative, as we've previously seen. Spending by the government is primarily consistent. Exporters, which other nations as well as the United States, are aggressively attempting to cut. There is only one last option, consumption. Put differently, China must find a way to persuade people to spend more money. The party has never been noted for its skill with softball diplomacy. As you can see, it has not only failed to do so thus far, but it has regressed. China's consumer spending accounts for less than 40% of the GDP. In comparison, Americans spend around 70% and Europeans pay over 50%. Recently, middle-class consumers' go-to investing strategy was purchasing real estate. Every urban couple could own an apartment or more frequently two or three and realize the Chinese dream if they saved a colossal amount of money and combined family funds. Before the majority of these houses were even built, they were sold, which gave the developers the money they needed to start making more right away. Therefore, all it took for the entire system to collapse last year was for a single group of buyers to cease making payments. The nation was instructed for 20 years that the only secure investment was real estate. Then real estate became an unsafe investment it makes sense why Chinese customers are anxious. So at this point, confidence is the issue. It's genuinely that easy. How do you spend or save your paycheck when you get it? Generally speaking, you save cash if you're not sure you'll keep getting more and spend it when you are. Chinese consumers though, aren't quite sure. Over the past four years, they've essentially piled money into their bank accounts and reduced their expenditures on large ostentatious purchases such as TVs, vehicles, and furnishings. They continue to travel, primarily within their own country. They continue to spend, mainly on sales. Naturally, businesses are decreasing their prices to encourage purchasing. Layoffs and reduced wages are a result of these declining pricing and earnings. Ultimately, by reducing consumer confidence, these layoffs are completing the cycle by reducing the likelihood of consumers going shopping. China must settle for slower economic development until it breaks this positive feedback loop. Okay, let's put everything into perspective. China's GDP expanded at the quickest rate of any major country in history between 1979 and the present, according to the World Bank. Those were an unusual 40 years. They couldn't last, and they were just not going to endure. Its economy is expanding, albeit at a far slower rate. There are still 700 million members of the middle class. Its military remains the second largest in the world. China is here to stay. To argue otherwise would be to go in the opposite direction and to overcorrect from the previous optimistic age. However, the rapid expansion that gave rise to conjecture about the Asian century is abating. It also has minimal capabilities. Demographics are at the core of this downturn. On paper, China could expand indefinitely as long as its population kept increasing, knowing there would be always enough people to populate every roadway, airport, and ghost city. However, China has been actively contracting since last year. With just 1.09 children born per woman, it boasts the lowest birth rate globally. Additionally, it is predicted that the labor force will decline by roughly 1% annually by 2030. One of the most intriguing questions surrounding this demographic collapse is why China maintained the one-child policy until 2016. But its authorities must have understood that the population would start to decline. And so it did. Now disaster looms over China's future. How do you think this situation can be overcome? Drop your thoughts in the comments section below. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you found this content valuable, and we'll see you in the next one.